I would like to have a, a, now an open discussion. I, we have a lot of experts sitting among you, uh, but uh, I'm going to start just to break the ice and asking you, do you really need the stimulation? Do you know if it is uh, just freeing the nerves could be enough, for instance, to get rid of a, of a pelvic pain? Why do you need to stimulate these patients? Do you have any study showing us that this is necessary? For the pelvic pain? For the pelvic pain. When you're doing like you have this endometriosis or scarring there, you have to you free the nerve. Sometimes just freeing the nerve could be enough. In most of the times, freeing the nerve is enough. It's in, about, in our cities, about 75 to 80% of the times, it's, it's going to be enough. It's, it's going to be 50%, at least uh, what we call enough is 50% reduction, reduction in the visual analog scale. And then sometimes you need some neuroleptics or like pregabalin or other drugs to, to uh, treat the pain memory. And, and Do you ever have to stimulate, to use a stimulator with, in the combination with this? And what is your indication for it? The, uh, I, I would do the simulator only when, when my decompression and the, the, the clinical treatment have failed. So we detrap the nerve. Then after detrapping the nerve, we go for sometimes one year of, of clinical treatment with physiotherapy, uh, transcutaneous uh, stimulation, uh, neuromodulation, and and some other pain management strategies. And if it doesn't work, then we modulate the nerve. Yeah, I have a question now for Helmut. Helmut Mothersbacher does not uh, require any, any introduction. So Thank you the very question much. For I would you, like to congratulate you. I have a question, Helmut, for you, for, sure. sorry. Sure. The question is, uh, what is the role of intravesical stimulation in this type of patient? Um, Intravesical stimulation can only be applied in incomplete lesions. You need some afferent nerves, but they, uh, if you have a detrusor underactivity and uh, low sensitivity, then you can improve the situation by intravesical electric stimulation. This is our indication, at least. Please go with Thank the you for, for your presentation. I'm very convinced that the pudendal nerve is a very good nerve and that the laparoscopic approach is an, ex an elegant way. However, I have seen patients operated according to Professor Possover with the Lyons procedure, five of them, there were four, four of them were spinal cord injured patients, and one was a multiple sclerosis patient. The aim was to suppress, uh, to avoid, to suppress the tissue contractions and to allow voiding. And I, was, I, I, I saw them, they, were, they, they didn't work well. I made video dynamics, and I could say that with, with the parameters Professor Possover said, and I tried it also, I was not able, surprisingly, to suppress the tusor overactivity, and I could not relax the sphincter, so we went up with the hertz up to 70 hertz. So what did you, diff what are your experience in regards to the bladder in these patients, uh, and what did you different, if you have very good results, to Professor Possover? Because his technique did not work. Oh, the parameters did not work. Uh, probably there was a displacement of, of, the, of the electrode, Professor, because if you didn't manage to, to, to induce uh, sphincter contraction, then, then, then it was not in place. The patients reported incontinence periods were a little bit longer, but that was due to sphincter activity, not to suppressing the, the detrusor overactivity. That was a surprise, and we couldn't find parameters uh, with, which could, with which we could achieve the goal. Maybe you have a solution, or Mr. Dr. Spine maybe Spinelli. Do you want to comment on this? No, my comment is that, uh, Nusselio, you know that uh, I like uh, these uh, studies and this possibility of approach, but my thinking is that uh, uh, we have to think about uh, our population of neurogenic patients. So we know that in this moment uh, there is a, a trend that is a very interesting trend uh, to use uh, neuromodulation very early, and this is a good way. And uh, perhaps uh, if uh, we are able to avoid overactivities, I think that is one of the key of our job. The second is the approach, because if we have the possibility to have a minimal invasive approach in a patient with uh, uh, spinal injury, after a short time from spinal injury, I think that it's impossible to propose to him uh, uh, invasive approach like the one described. This is the, the practice that we have every day in our spinal unit. And so this is difficult. It's the same to propose to a patient, I do a posterior rhizotomy or something like that. So 
The problem, I think, that is uh, also to really understand what is in our mind about what is modulation and what is direct stimulation. They are two different things. And so perhaps uh, we will able in the future to have a continuous modulation to restore some function, but uh, if we want to restore a, direct stimu a, a, a function, sometimes we need a direct stimulation. I think that uh, perhaps with this observation, in time we will be able to have an approach on these nerves uh, without uh, to use uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, open surgery, robotic surgery. But uh, it's, a, it's a good way to arrive. I think but that uh, the, the truth is that we need an improvement under the technological point of view, because we have IPG that are not able to have few channels for that. We have uh, leads uh, that we need uh, with a good fixation because uh, one of the critics that I know, uh, also yesterday say to you, but haven't you displacement of the lead uh, inside the pelvis? And so this is my comment. You said, would it be possible to do uh, the positioning of these uh, four uh, leads that you are doing uh, uh, in a less invasive approach, as percutaneously approach? It's possible that yes, yeah. probably. Uh, we're, uh, we're trying to, um, but I'm still working on, on, on improving the results of, of the direct simulation. And then, because I think we have to improve the technique overall and, and finding the right parameters and then, uh, and then try to, to do it in a less invasive way. So continuing to, to answer your question, Professor, uh, what, oh, oh, I'm still on the seventh case and so far what we've seen is I've managed to, to, bring, uh, to, to bring the first uh, detrusor contraction uh, about 50% more. So the patients with 180 to 200, they will go to 270 to 300 milliliters until the first contraction. And what it doesn't work for is uh, compliance. That's the first thing. Some of the patients, they, they experience a period where their incontinence gets worse, actually, because uh, the neuromodulation works on, on uh, uh, striated muscle uh, uh, spasticity. And in some of these, these patients, what keeps their continence is the dyssynergia. So when you diminish this dyssynergia, which is good in the long term, but it, sometimes you, you can get those patients for, with a period that is going to be about one to two months of worse incontinence until you find new right parameters for that. Yeah, but so those you, patients working, are good responders. You're working actually. with the, st and the striated muscle through a direct stimulation. That's why we, how you fatigue muscle and then uh, you obtain this good result. But uh, uh, I have a question for, uh, for you, Mikel, and then uh, I would like to hear also uh, Nuselius uh, thought about this. You said that uh, you are thinking about uh, starting earlier with the pudendal stimulation even before uh, using uh, botulinum toxin. So what is your criteria to going with one towards the other? Remember, you have to show us that uh, using a neuromodulation right away to the pudendal nerve, which is not approved and it's uh, quite an expensive thing, is uh, cheaper than using uh, botulinum toxin. What is your approach with these patients? So, uh, as I said, if it's possible, and uh, I can understand also about cost and so, but uh, uh, if it's possible in incomplete lesion and uh, with uh, neurogenic overactive bladder, first approach with pudendal nerve, I think that is a good way, because if you obtain uh, good results, uh, even if the patients continue to use subcatheterization on uh, overactivity, that's a good choice. So if you have a patient that, uh, for example, uh, have not responses to antimuscarinics before uh, to use botulinum toxin, even if, uh, if you look at our population, we have 64 patients implanted and we have 400 patients every year for botulinum toxin. And so is what I said in the beginning. We need in this moment to find new waves because uh, we are speaking as botulinum toxin as a new option we are using from 20 years, botulinum toxin. And then we have a new generation of patients uh, that has been submitted to 
repetition of botulinum toxin, and really they yes to something. I but listen what, what to is your criteria? So if I have to explain one, to one the of, resident, so what is the patient the, that goes one for? One of the criteria is that uh, if uh, I do a manometry, a, a very simple manometry, uh, when uh, they, they have the overactivity, and I do an acute stimulation uh, of the dorsal nerve of the penis, and I have an inhibition uh, of, of the bladder, this could be a good candidate. What about you? How do you evaluate these patients? Oh. My indication for, for Botox? For Botox uh, versus uh, uh, something more invasive, like uh, positioning of uh, leads close to the, the, the pudendal nerve laparoscopically or percutaneously. The, the thing is, when you, you, the, you're comparing two different, completely different things, yeah. uh, because we're not only thinking about uh, the urinary rehabilitation. So if the patient doesn't have a, a chance or have very little chance of uh, standing up and, and, and thinking in some steps, then it makes no sense to, to, to do such an invasive procedure. However, when you think about uh, motoric uh, uh, rehabilitation of these patients, there's, there's a lot of benefits that come from it. They, they have better blood flow that reduces their, their ulcer pressure risk. They, they have an increase in, in, in 10 to 15 centimeters of uh, thigh circumference over the first month of stimulation. So that's a lot of muscle mass. That means bone, bony mass uh, uh, gain too, and, and that's lower insulin resistance. So the overall uh, uh, gain is, is much wider, but only in patients that have enough trunk control to stand up and, and then it makes sense. Otherwise, I would just go with the Botox or, or some other minimally invasive uh, neuromodulation approach. I have another question for both of you. You are using uh, a visual identification of the nerve and the position of the lid. Do you think it would be interesting or important to have a functional evaluation of your stimulation and the position of the lid to, with the nerve? Yeah, it is. That's something I do different from Posova. He doesn't test the motoric threshold, and I, I on, I'm only satisfied when I've got the, the, the electrode in an optimal position. I only... Uh, uh, what is time your I functional evaluation? I, I, I evaluate the, the sphincter contraction for the, for the pudendal nerve at at least three volts. It's a maximum threshold I accept. I get a, a plantar flexion and rotation of the feet. So it's a pure with, motor response. You don't motor. look at the, the poten potential? No, yeah. we don't do evoke oh, potential. So what about uh, you, uh, Michele? I know that you are a big fan of this. Uh, uh, you were a big believer of functional evaluation, even more than the, the, in, the pudendal, in pudendal uh, is uh, mandatory to have uh, a, a functional evaluation with neurophysiology of the FEMAP because in our experience uh, you can have a contraction of the sphincter, but it's only a, a volume, conducted volume of the muscles. In using direct stimulation, and this is the Brindley experience, uh, no? we lose a lot of time for every nerve to do your dynamics uh, in every stimulation to find the best parameters. And so it's very important. I think that uh, only objective uh, responses that we can see are not sufficient to justify to put a lead in this place. Well, I would like to thank you all to participate to this uh, very interesting round table and uh, uh, Nuselio and Michele to share with us uh, the, the new trends in the neuromodulation. Thank you very much. Thank you.